Well, our text for this evening <clears throat> comes to us from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Listen now for a word from God. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth, And laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Now in that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. Look, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those whom God favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is God's word to us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Good and loving God, we do thank you for this story, even if we've heard it every year for as long as we can remember. And God, we thank you for the words, we thank you for the wisdom, and God, I pray that you would open our hearts to you and your spirit this evening. And that God, whatever wisdom, whatever thoughts, whatever you would have us here, I pray it would come from you and not from me. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I had this professor in college, um, actually in graduate school. Uh, we're going to call her Dr. Smith. And Dr. Smith was... Um, my favorite professor, but also maybe one of the most annoying professors I had, <laughs> because she would always ask questions after you asked her a question. So the, the simple one would be, Dr. Smith, when's that final paper due? Did you check your syllabus? Good question. <laughs> no. Um, or, you know, she just, in any question you can think of, she always had a question that she would ask you. But this is part of her teaching technique as well. So, you know, she might, you might ask a question like, uh, or she might ask you a question, what color is the sky? And you would all would say, <laughs> blue, yes, sometimes gray in Michigan. Um, it's blue, and then she, she would say, well, well, why? And then you might say, science. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why the sky's blue. But she would keep going. She would see how far she could get to five whys. And she would play this game. She would tell you at the beginning of her classes in the semester, hey, if you ask a question or if I ask you a question, we might get into a little game where we play five whys together. Often, uh, folks wouldn't be asked why five times because you'd get stumped three whys in. And you should try it on like anything that you think you know well. Uh, Just ask yourself why, like five times. See how deep you can go. But the professor's point was, how much do you actually know about the things you think you know about, right? Like, why is the sky blue? I I have no idea. That's something I I might go research tonight. 
Um, and then when you find an answer, ask why again. See how far you can go. And she often encouraged us to do that with, with scripture and with many other things in life. It's a really, really fun game, and it's a great way um, to sort of embody a toddler in some ways. Any of you that have hung out with toddlers at all? Why, 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 why? But we're going to play that game tonight a little bit. I was, I was thinking about her, and I was thinking about that game as I came to this text once again. And I really did sort of have this, like, wrestling sort of struggle with it because I thought, why, why are we still reading this? Why, after 2,000 years of telling it, do we still come back and do it? Why do people show up to church at night on a cold and frigid evening to hear this story? Why this one? Why is it still going? You know, and we might come up with a few answers right off the bat, right? We might say, well, we, we want to make sure that we keep the, uh, the reason for the season in the right place, right? We, might, we want to make sure we keep uh, Christ in Christmas, right? We want to remember what this season's really all about. But to that, I would ask, and my professor would ask, why? That's what we've always done. Well, why? <laughs> why? Why? So I want to see tonight if we can go a little bit deeper into some of these characters that we've come across in the text and just see what we can learn from this story. So in order to do this, I'm going to uh, talk a lot about world history. Are there any historians in here at all? Anyone? I'm not seeing any hands. That's great, because I'm going to fly fast and loose with world history, and I don't need any speed bumps in my way, all right? So... Please do your research. I, I think I have all of my facts correct, but it, it was a lot to internalize, and so if I mess something up, um, feel free to shoot me an email to correct me, but I'm a pastor, not a historian. So first we're going to talk about Caesar, and then we're going to talk about Herod, and then we're going to talk about Joseph, and then we're going to talk about Mary, and if we have time left over, we'll talk a little bit about Jesus, okay? Just a little bit. Caesar. So there was this guy named Julius Caesar who uh, had an affair with a woman named Cleopatra. And the, the love child of that affair was called Caesarean. And Caesarean is a really interesting name to choose because it means king of kings and lord of lords. King of kings and lord of lords which sounds a lot like the titles of someone else that we talk about a lot here. King of Kings, Lord of Lords. What's also interesting about Caesarean was that uh, his father, Julius Caesar, at one point, uh, it was declared that Caesar, this is by the Roman government, it was declared that Caesar is God. This was a national decree. This was written down. This was a law. Caesar is God. So Caesar, as God, deserves all honor, glory, praise, hymns, and tax money. This is what we give to God, right? But if Caesar is God, then that means that Caesarean, the king of kings and lord of lords, is also the son of God. Sounds like someone else I know. So Caesarean tragically passes away, and he's not able to ascend to the throne. So what Julius Caesar does is he adopts his nephew. His nephew's name is Octavian. He'll later change his name to Caesar Augustus. And Augustus, uh, uh, Caesar Augustus essentially means uh, king of all the known world and the heavens and the earth, all of that. Caesar Augustus. Now, after uh, he, he takes over, there's actually a civil war that's going on in Rome at the time. He's got to kind of settle things, and, and he does. It takes him, I think, 10 years to figure this, this war out. And once uh, Caesar Augustus emerges as the only king of Rome, and the only one that is going to rule, he begins the process of expanding his kingdom. And he actually has a lot of support for this. Rome is, is actually uh, behind him. The, the poet Horace and the historian actually wrote about Caesar that uh, the, the birthday of Caesar, I think this is how it goes, the birthday of Caesar is the beginning of the gospel and the good news for the whole world. Because Caesar is the one that comes 
to wipe away all our sins. That also sounds very, very familiar. Caesar wipes away all our sins. So he's got all the support and he's going about, you know, he, he realizes, okay, I've made peace in Rome. Now I think I'm going to go make peace in the world. And he begins the process of expanding his empire and creating this great peace. And this peace comes about by Caesar marching his armies into these towns and villages and provinces one by one. And he would go in and he would speak to the leaders of the community and, uh, the, you know, his, his commanders, whoever, would say this phrase. They had this phrase. They would say, Caesar is Lord. And the people who were hearing this had the option. They had, they had two options. One, they could say back, yes, Caesar is Lord. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He wipes away all of our sins and we give him all honor, glory, and praise. And then they would bend down as a sign of submission, and then they would be accepted into the uh, Roman citizenship, though not entirely because they weren't given full citizenship, they were just allowed to pay taxes and keep their life. If you hear that clicking in the back, that is uh, undoubtedly one of our boilers or one of our uh, radiators going off. <laughs> it is not a ghost of Fort Street Past, <laughs> just banging on that. Oh, man. What a night, Pastor Sarah. <laughs> what a night. Boy, we are, they, all these people are coming back next year. <laughs> Just blowing them out of the water here. <laughs> I appreciate y'all laughing with me. So Caesar begins expanding his empire, right? And, and after he, he does, oh, the, the second option. So if, if you decided, mm, I don't know if I really want to be a Roman citizen, what they would do is essentially just, they would have you killed on the spot. And the way they did that was by a cross, something else that sounds familiar. And oftentimes what they would do is they would line these crosses along the road going into major cities so that anyone traveling into those cities would understand that you probably shouldn't resist Rome and also Rome has been here and they rule this world. Caesar has taken over. So Caesar continues this process, but in, in order to continue to expand, he actually has to raise more and more money, right? And the way that he does this is by taking a census, making sure he knows the population of all the areas and the provinces that he has dominated and taken over, and he would count the people, and then he would decide, okay, how far do we want to go this year? We need to budget for this. We need more, you know, camels and horses over there. We need more food to these troops, and he would figure it all out. And he would take his taxes, and then he would continue his march to take over the world. Now, I think I read somewhere, and this, it doesn't sound right in my head, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this is right. Uh, at, at one point, the kingdom of Rome expanded all the way from India to England. Now, I don't have a, a map of Europe <laughs> memorized, but it, that seems like a really big area, almost too big. From India all the way to England, Caesar is doing this. He's marching into towns, and he's essentially giving you two options, bow down or lose your life. Now, again, he still has support from Rome. In fact, he's got a lot of fans that are saying, hey, this is a kind of peace, because everywhere the military goes and dominates, there's no more wars. There's no more scuffles. No one ever puts up a fuss anymore. This is great. We don't have to worry about invading armies. We don't have to worry about anything except the taxes, <laughs> and our lives, if, you know, we get out of line, we say something critical of the throne. There are a few other things to worry about, but for the most part, he had support, and, and this support began to be called, um, they, they began to say of Caesar that he was bringing salvation to the world. You can read this. I think, I think the poet Virgil said that. Caesar brings salvation to the world. Again, sounds a lot like things we say about Jesus. So that's Caesar. And this is sort of the, um, the, the context into which this story begins to emerge. You have a ruthless king that considers himself God, considers his children sons of God, and thinks that 
and he's going to take over the entire world. Then there was Herod. Herod is kind of a self-appointed king of the Jews. And this, this was not, um, a, again, a title that the Jewish people at the time gave to him. It was a title that he took for himself. He actually, when he figured out what Caesar Augustus was up to and what he was doing, he wanted to get ahead of the curve. And he said, I'm going to go to Rome. And he did, and he went into the Senate, and he basically just said, hey, if you make me king of the Jews, I will do whatever you want. I'll rule the way that you rule. I will dominate the way that you dominate. Just give me the crown. And so Caesar said, sure, okay, you can do that. So Herod goes, and he's ruling a small province um, in Judea, and he is the king. And so he begins to act like the king, only Herod as king doesn't have to do as much, you know, military domination. Caesar's done that for him. He gets to have a lot more fun. And so Caesar starts raising taxes on the people in the area, and he begins building all of these things. He loved building things. And I, I have like a full, lit, like 10 things that he built. I'm only going to talk about like one or two. Uh, he built a mountain, okay, an actual mountain in the middle of the desert where it was flat to commemorate this military victory that he had had. And so he had all of these stones brought uh, by these workers, and, and they piled it up until it was a mountain big enough for his liking, and then he named it after himself. He called it Herodium, which is really clever. And th this mountain just sort of stood there, and it was erected to honor him. And funny thing about this mountain, uh, there are some scholars that think this is the same mountain that Jesus was looking at when he said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, if you have enough faith, you can say to this mountain, go into the sea, and the mountain will go into the sea. Because the idea is there that if King Herod can build a mountain, well then by the grace and help of God, you can tear it down. So he built a mountain. Uh, he built a theater as well. He built this, this theater that was uh, actually near Nazareth where Jesus uh, was, was from, where Joseph was working. And he built a few other. He built a, an entire city called Caesarea uh, to honor the Caesar and to sort of do a little brown nosing. Um, and he, he built Caesarea actually to get more tax revenue because there were a bunch of ships that were going in and out of the port. And so he raised more and more money and he grew Caesar's army and he grew the things that he was building and it really just promoted his reputation. But he was really just sort of Caesar light and considered himself the son of God. Caesar is God and the king below him is maybe not family, but still an extension of Caesar. Herod gets to play son of God. And he played the part well. You know, at, uh, upon his death, he ordered uh, like 20 influential people in Jerusalem to be put to death so that he could guarantee on his death day that there was mourning in all of Jerusalem. That's who Herod was. And Herod, along with Caesar, was a prince of peace, a king among kings, maybe not the king of kings, a lord among lords, maybe not lord of lords. He was awful. <laughs> he was awful. So that's Herod. So th there's Caesar, who's ruling over everyone and everything. And then there's Herod, who's ruling over a small part and doing an awful job at it. And then there's Joseph. And one of the first questions I had when I, when I was reading that, that Joseph had to travel back, and I was kind of paying attention, was why is Joseph leaving his homeland? Why isn't he already in Bethlehem? Because Jewish people at the time had, had very strong ties to their land, and often that land was passed down from generation to generation. Um, sometimes there were 10 generations, 20 generations, maybe 25, 30. I mean, this land stayed in the family. So why is Joseph not in Bethlehem? Why is he all the way out in Nazareth? And I read something that it, it, was, it was likely because the pressure of all the taxes that these people had to pay had actually displaced them from their ancestral lands. 
So the, the taxes from Caesar and then the taxes from Herod, and then because Joseph is a good Jewish man, he paid tax to the temple as well. Triple taxation. We complain about double taxation in this country, and <laughs> triple, triple. I read somewhere it would not be uncommon that a family during that time living in that region would have been taxed somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of their income. And so as a result, they have to forfeit all of this ancestral land, and they're pushed off of it, and suddenly Joseph, who should have inherited more, has become a migrant day worker just looking to survive. That sounds familiar. In America in 2022. But Joseph gets word from an angel. And the angel basically tells him, hey, God's up to something. Don't worry about this. You're going to have a son. And he's going to be called God Saves. This would have signaled something to Joseph, because Joseph would have known the Hebrew text. He would have known the story of their God, this God that brought the people out of Egypt, liberated his people, and set them free from another oppressive king. And so when Joseph gets word from this angel that something else is going to happen, He's likely confused and scared, but maybe, maybe there's a little bit of hope that God is going to work again in the same way that God had worked all those years before. And then there's Mary. Mary is likely 13 or 14 at the time, and that was uh, just the way things happen. I think life expectancy was 40, if not a little bit more than 40, and so uh, at 14, life was getting started. This is when you got married. This is when you had children. And she is likely caught in the middle. She's seeing this man that she is uh, going to wed, struggling to find work, being forced away from his homeland. And she is being dragged along with him. But she also, is, uh, she also encounters an angel. And this angel comes to her and tells her essentially what was told to Joseph. Hey, God is up to something. This child is going to come into the world, and you're going to name him God Saves, Jesus. And he'll be called the Prince of Peace. He'll be called the King of Kings. He'll be called the Lord of Lords. He will be the one that wipes away all of our sins. He will bring salvation to the earth. And after Mary hears this, she sings this song, and you can read it in Luke chapter 1. We often call it the Magnificat, uh, or Mary's song. But what Mary says is essentially, it's this song of praise, and she's praising that finally God is going to act, and the system's coming down. God is not going to allow Caesar to behave this way anymore. God is not going to allow his people to suffer. She's happy about this. She's elated. She can't wait, even if there is still a little bit of nervousness and turmoil inside of her. And then Jesus arrives. And Jesus is so scary to Herod (laughs) that Herod puts out this decree and says, anyone under the age of two needs to be done away with. Because he had heard a rumor that maybe there was going to be another newborn king and and blah, 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 and he felt a little bit paranoid, a little afraid. But Jesus shows up in a manger, wrapped in strips of cloth, among barn animals, and we call him the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, the one that wipes away our sins, our Savior, bringer of salvation. And you might be wondering still, why do we read this every single year on Christmas? 
why, why are we still doing this? And I think the answer lies somewhere in reminding ourselves, especially those of us that might still live in an empire, it's really important to remember who you give your praise to, who you give your honor to, who you give glory to, who do you worship? Who has the right to be called God? It's really important that we remember these things because these realities, these tyrants, these emperors, these evils in the world, they still exist. And whether you put your faith and your trust in Jesus or whether you don't, I think we all need to be reminded that those forces are out there. But we, together, can stand against them. And we don't stand against them playing the same games that Caesar played or the same games that the other kings played. We don't do it by violence. We don't do it by domination. We don't bring about peace in those ways. We do it through love. We do it by praying for those who persecute us. Praying for our enemies. Loving them. So no matter where you are, I hope you'll see the political reality of this old, old story. And I hope you see too why we remember it each and every year. Let's pray. Good and loving God, thank you for today. God, thank you for this story. Thank you for Mary and Joseph. God, and thank you for all of the characters. God, I pray that we would remember our calling in this world, and that we would remember who to worship, who to give our honor and our glory to throughout all of our days. In Jesus' name, amen.